to uh, today's webinar, which is on livable neighbourhoods. Um, I'd like to, my name's Dina Romero and I'm the leader of Bath and Orsi Somerset Council. And I'd like to uh, ask my panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with uh, Jessica Fox Taylor. Hello, I'm Jessica Fox Taylor. I'm the principal engineer for sustainable transport. So in long and short, um, I lead a team that encourages people to uh, walk and cycle and use active travel as much as possible. Thank you, Jess. Uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Chris Major to introduce himself. Hello there, I'm Chris Major. I'm Assistant Director for Highways and Transport for the Council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hello, I am Councillor Joanna Wright. I am Councillor for Lambridge Ward and I am also Joint Cabinet Member for Transport Services. And uh, Councillor Butters. Hello, Councillor Neil Butters, uh, also Joint Cabinet Member for Transport Services. I represent Bath Avon South Ward, which is a very large geographical area ranging from Marksbury through to Claverton. Thank you. Thank you. And now the, the, the theme of uh, today's webinar is around livable neighbourhoods, as I said, and it's actually about the, um, the policy that is behind livable neighbourhoods. So I'm going to pass on to, to Chris uh, to tell us a bit more about what is in the policy. Thank you, Dina. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's OK. I've got a short presentation just to work through. OK, as part of the celebration for National Clean Air Day tomorrow, I'm really pleased to be able to give an update on our livable neighbourhoods work and how it links in the widest sense to our aim to improve air quality within our towns, our city and our rural areas. We're acutely aware that we've not been able to hold our normal drop-in sessions uh, to engage with people. So this uh, presentation really goes out to those who know less about the schemes and the aims rather than those who are well versed in the, in the approach. Um, Firstly, I'm really pleased to be able to confirm, due to the interest locally around what we're doing, that we've been asked and agreed to extend the closing date of our consultation to the 18th of October to ensure that everybody has a chance to respond. We've already had over uh, 1,100 responses to date, um, and we're really keen to hear everybody's views as we go forward. Uh, the key message really is that livable neighbourhoods are not just a traffic scheme. We're trying to give people the opportunity to address issues within their day-to-day -day lives. The World Health Authority is clear that we face a public health emergency. Obesity and other uh, non-communicable diseases are causing significant strain on health services across the country. We spend over eight billion per year dealing with the cost of physical inactivity. If we raised our levels of cycling nationally to the same level as say Denmark, we could save the NHS over 17 billion pounds over 20 years. We know that 20 minutes of exercise can reduce the risk of developing depression by up to 31% and it increases the productivity of workers. We also know that children who are active achieve better grades and walking and cycling to school helps children arrive ready to learn. The changes in traffic levels during lockdown were stark for all to see. And we already saw some of the types of benefits from living in livable neighborhoods coming forward with reports of people hearing birds singing and noise levels overall being reduced. We noticed that the air seemed cleaner and we were able to exercise safely. However, traffic levels and particularly NO2, NOx levels are returning back to where they were previously. And this has required us to continue with our plans for the clean air zone that we've been promoting. The livable neighborhood strategies are promoted to help capture those benefits and embed them in the day-to-day -day experience for all. Reflecting this, we've proposed as part of the overall strategy, this vision as a key part of the work we're promoting. In line with the messages from Clean Air Day, that we know, we know that air quality has a spe specific and measurable impact on the health and well-being of people within our towns and cities. And this is particularly acute for those with conditions such as asthma or COPD. And also further evidence is coming forward of the impact on COVID-19. We want to link places together for active travel routes for walking and cycling. We want to use a strategy to, to address noise, danger and air quality issues within your neighbourhoods, but to go further and create better places for people. Obviously, reducing rat running in residential areas is therefore a key part of the overall strategy. 
is something that's raised with us time and time again from people from all areas, from the rural areas affected by traffic to Bristol, for example, to the centre of the city where some roads seen significant traffic flows to avoid the key pinch areas. We also recognise not everybody can walk and, walk and cycle easily. In developing livable neighbourhoods, we'll be giving careful consideration to supporting people with disabilities, those with restricted mobility and additional needs to have their say and influence design. It's important to stress that livable neighbourhoods do not stop vehicles accessing local homes, but they can improve access for those with restricted mobility and provide safer, more pleasant places for people to get around. The approach we're taking also aligns with central government policy released, released in August called Gear Change, a bold vision for cycling and walking, and their policy called LTM 120, which sets new standards, standards for infrastructure. At central government level, it's accepted and recommended that we have to make changes to the way we're traveling and to make walking and cycling the central tenets of our policy making. We're really excited about this. And despite many challenges, it also uh, it brings such as uh, limited road space, the need to make sure we support those who do need a car and the requirement to deliver both within additional resources and in a timely manner. We're keen to see real progress over the next few years in changing the way people travel. The question we have is how do we do this in a way that's open, transparent and inclusive? The reality is how, it com is how it comes down to how we can come together and work to find solutions to the issues we're facing. I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect solution, particularly at the start, but the opposite approach of doing nothing is not acceptable in light of the health crisis we're facing. As set out within the gear change documents, it's clear that the real cost of unrestricted motoring are substantial. There's long term impacts on previous policies and we're going to have to think differently to address them and it's going to be challenging. While cycling features strongly in many of the proposals, for me, it's walking that provides a real opportunity for change for many of us. Providing an environment that encourages walking and cycling will start to provide a different way of thinking about how we travel. To be clear, the aims of livable neighbourhoods isn't to prevent those essential trips we all make on occasion. It's about making sure people have a choice, a safe choice to travel as they want in ever larger numbers. It's to make sure that the allocation of road space reflects the priorities of all groups rather than areas and neighbourhoods being uh, dominated by vehicles. But we know that one size does not fit all. This leads us to be able to see neighbourhoods in a different way. Evidence suggests that as much as 15% of traffic disappears entirely when you develop a livable neighbourhood and this level of change would be really positive if, if it was reflected locally. We also know that reductions in car use can be positive for local businesses as more and more people shop locally. If someone suggested another way of gaining such benefits in reduction in traffic levels, increasing health outcomes and boosting businesses for a similar level of cost, we would of course all explore it. But what we do know is there is no option to build more and more roads and continue to increase the numbers of vehicles on those roads because we simply do not have the space. A key point is that the development of livable neighbourhoods does not prevent anyone using the car or entering the zone for deliveries. It does, however, reduce through traffic and requires changes in the way that trips are undertaken. As I said before, this may not be easy and we'll have to be open to, to hearing all views as we develop the plans, but the option to do nothing is not one we can take if we want to deliver the better places for all we desire. We all know that we're seeing more and more traffic on the roads. If you drive regularly, the quiet periods have seemed to have disappeared. The levels of increase in vehicles has far outgrown the available space, and we've all gotten used to nipping out in the car for work, for leisure, and sometimes even just for a drive. On top of this, we've had to deal with the issue of bigger cars. The increased use of SUVs contributes to the fact that cars have got, on average, about 20% bigger over the last two decades, and thus they're taking up more road space each when driving, and of course, when parking as well. The numbers of vehicles registered bar 2020 due to COVID-19 continues to increase. By 2022, we're likely to have over 40 million vehicles on the road network nationally. Therefore, whether or not we take action, all streets are likely to see increased traffic as people use more and more shortcuts to avoid known delays. The only way to prevent this is to offer real choices in the way that people move, ensuring joined up walking and cycling corridors that have pleasant, pleasant environments and safe infrastructure. I suppose the question is, are we prepared to allow the numbers of vehicles on all roads to continue to increase? Is it the preferred option we want to take? 
This can be a difficult question to answer as we recognise fully that some trips are absolutely vital and cannot be taken in, uh, undertaken in another way. However, by removing those trips that can be done differently, more space is allocated to the essential trips and therefore surely everyone wins in that scenario. The question we begin to ask ourselves should be, is each and every trip I undertake essential? And do I want this to be the future for me, my family and my community? However, we mustn't lose sight that traffic levels on the main A road corridors nationally is generally flat. According to the DFT figures and replicated here, we have seen less than 1% increase since 1994. Urban A roads are better suited to high levels of traffic as they're generally wider, but again, this does not mean they should be seen as a total solution to problems. Increasing the strategic cycle corridors remains a key deliverable to link journeys end to end, from livable neighbourhood to livable neighbourhood, from home to workplace and from shops to schools. Obviously the question then come, uh, becomes, where have the extra cars gone? And many of you know, they've started to use the residential roads to avoid queuing, disrupting the normal ability to travel in those areas and making all of the streets noisier, more polluted and more dangerous. This issue has been further impacted by the use of sat-nav and similar apps. People no longer need to be able to find local roads through local knowledge. They can just switch on their app and find their way through. And we're seeing the impact of that on a daily basis. Things like playing in the street for many children has disappeared, but there was no clear consultation on whether or not that was what we wanted. Neighbours see less and less of each other as the parking and movement of traffic has segregated to communities and change the way we communicate with each other. The changes happen slowly over time and without thinking differently and changes in our policy, we won't get those opportunities back. But what about the people? How do we make sure we hear everybody's views? Who should we listen to? For example, we regularly hear about how everyone drives. Is it the case? Do the majority really drive? Actually, it's only about half the population have a driving license and a significant portion of those who don't have no choice in the matter. They're either too young to drive or have reasons such as a medical condition, they can't hold a license. This is a significant proportion of the population who cannot drive, but do not necessarily have their transport needs considered within the historic decision-making processes. Of those eligible for a license, it's about 75% of the population have one. But again, it's much lower at the younger and older end of the age spectrum. This identifies another significant proportion of the population who may benefit from livable neighbourhoods approaches. We're really keen to get people involved in the design process who may not normally have done so to ensure that the designs are both equitable and inclusive. We know that cars dominate transport choice with over 61% of the journeys taken, but we cannot forget that corner, the quarter of our journeys are already walked, particularly in Bath where we have a high level of walking and the opportunity to increase it further. Cycling has a low level of usage and hopefully the changes we're proposing will help increase that number, particularly for those sort of longer journeys up to about eight miles. We also know that there are many disabled people who can and do cycle or use mobility scooters on a regular basis and many more who would like to if the road conditions allowed them to. In Baines we also know we have a high level of car ownership in many areas, although generally car ownership increases by income band with households in the lower quartile having an, of income, having a significantly reduced likelihood of having access to a car. Our proposals for updating the residence parking schemes can help reduce the impact of commuter and student parking. In residential areas, particularly in Bath, there is significant demand from shoppers and commuters for on-street parking. This congests local street and reduces the parking opportunities for residents. Our Liverpool neighbourhood consultation proposed, uh, proposals encourage active travel and restricts non-local traffic and demand for parking this brings, moving them to public transport, out to the park and rides and into car parks. If we can reclaim the space, we can then be used to install modal filters and better cycling and walking uh, infrastructure for everyone. One way to further reduce demand for car ownership is to encourage electric car clubs so people share cars when they need them. If existing resident parking zones or other measures in place need to be reviewed and altered to, uh, to accept this, then we're keen to look at that. Careful consideration must also be given to ensure that the impact of one residence parking scheme does not impact on the parking in a neighbouring area. 
The reality is the changes in behaviour needed to achieve the climate declaration commitments are significant. Road traffic contributes approximately 29% of CO2 in Baines. We need to think about reducing mileage by about 25% per annum to reduce this and achieve the outcomes from the Climate Declaration Action Plan. With 70% of journeys less than 5k in urban areas, at least some of these can easily be changed to walking or cycling. Many people already do this for, some, for at least some of their journeys, and the key is making sure most of those journeys, making sure that many more of those journeys are converted. The map gives an indication of three kilometres from Milsom Street, and 42% of the journeys by car are shorter than this distance. We've been told for decades that the path to freedom is within a car, and there's been very little focus on the impacts of that behaviour. The motor industry shows commercials of empty roads, and the reality of the situation is that we get more and more vehicles on the roads, and this allows us less and less opportunity to, ever, to choose other transport options safely. The motor, motor industry, according to Deloitte, spends over £1.47 billion per year promoting the need for more cars. To encourage people not to drive, we need for them to feel there are real joined up alternatives. The evidence from many studies suggests that the biggest barrier is segregated infrastructure and the proposals for livable neighbourhoods starts the process of joining up the strategic route infrastructure with local changes to encourage and support the use of cycling. So our next steps. Once our consultation is closed and if the strategies are supported, we plan to put them forward for adoption for the end of the year. We've also appointed additional resource to be dedicated on the alignment and development of our wider sustainable transport programmes and to lead the co-design and, and engagement with communities so we are able to listen to all views and collate the options. In the same way that traffic levels have increased over time, the reduction of traffic is likely to take some time for people to switch behaviours and find new ways of travelling. The use of experimental traffic regulation orders allows communities to collect the information to help formulate the final schemes. A closing statement really is, we recognise that, as with any scheme, there is no perfect solution and compromise will be necessary at times. But we're keen to show that by working together, listening to the different viewpoints and understanding what may be possible, we will deliver the improvements necessary to protect people's health. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, I think that was a huge amount of information there. So it's just to reassure people who might not have been making quite the amount of copious notes that uh, they might suddenly realise they wanted to make, that uh, that information will be available um, on the on our channel um, when this is uh, put onto uh, the YouTube, uh, onto um, sorry, the Council's YouTube channel in due course. Um, so we've had an awful lot of questions that have already been sent in. Uh, we also have um, some questions that are coming in already. So just so that our audience is uh, aware of what I plan to do, we will try and answer as many of the questions that have been sent in and those that are coming in live as we can. But any that we can't answer, you know, we, simply because of time, we will endeavour to get a, uh, a formal answer uh, at least uh, onto the YouTube channel along with the uh, presentation that you've just seen. So, um, Chris, you were talking about the, the policy that we're consulting on. Why are we consulting on the, the policy? Why don't we just go ahead and implement low traffic neighborhoods um, and all the other uh, you know, ideas that are, are within the uh, Liverpool Neighborhood Scheme? Thanks, uh, perhaps, uh, Chris, if you'd like to come in then and I'll ask Jessica to come in after that. Sure. Thanks, Dina. Yeah, I think it's really important. What we're trying to do is set up a very strong um, strategy basis for people to be able to understand what we're trying to achieve and how we um, intend to achieve it over the, the, the future. By consulting on the strategies now, it allows us to get the views of people that we can understand what they want, the areas that it needs to be strengthened, um, the areas that they feel need more work to make sure that the strategies we adopt for that long term delivery uh, are as, as good as they can be and they make sure that they reflect the views um, of those who respond to the consultation. Thank you. Uh, Jess. Thank you. Uh, yes, we want to um, ensure that we are being absolutely democratic in, in, the, in our process. Um, so rather than going straight for individual um, 
schemes um, and we understand that there are many different opinions about um, schemes and there are many different types of schemes that we can implement as well we are starting with a, a this a, a broad foundation to make a strong foundation and making sure that people have an understanding and the opportunity to feed back to us what they think of the underlying policy before we ever get into the granularity of detail about the individual scheme thank you very much jess uh, can Joe, I just add, I mean, yeah, can I just add to that? So um, as the Liberal Democrats um, in the last local elections committed in their manifesto to bringing in changes to transport, and one of them was to look at livable neighbourhoods. So this was always on our agenda. And how we do that is to work with the general public to say, look, this is why we think it's a good idea. It's a good idea because it helps with public health. It's a good idea because it helps with the climate emergency and it's a good idea because it helps with social justice. Now those key three things are really important to lots of people and how we see them as a whole requires us as a community to come together to discuss how we take this forward and work to achievable solutions. However we deliver these schemes, no group of any, nobody is going to be pleased. You know, I, I, in my own head where I live in Bath have clearly looked at what op options I have locally. And I, the first thing I think is, well, I won't be able to do this now in my car. But I also then have to recognize that where I live is by three major schools. And the impact that that would have on so many young people's lives who can't drive would be significant. So. The way we want to do this is through policy. We want to be open and transparent. We want people to engage, but we also have to recognize that with the world and the way it is now, we are going to have to change and that we can't accept the number of cars moving around in the way they have, and that we need to put in place significant measures to help residents in their communities. Thank you, Joe. And to, I, I think, you know, this has picked up on some of the questions that have already come in. There's a sense that uh, livable neighbourhoods are appropriate for an urban space, for the city and for major towns. But what about the rural areas? Neil, as someone who represents a, a rural area, what are your what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you, Dina. Um, yes, you're right. To raise the question of the rural areas. This is not just a Bath thing. Um, we do want to extend the opportunity to people uh, throughout the district to benefit from this policy wherever appropriate. So I don't know if you'd like me to address the question from Timsbury at this juncture, or should I do that a bit later? No, that's absolutely fine, please. Um, <laughs> you can speak yes. about Timsbury, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I was very sorry to hear the problem mentioned, um, in particular that her uh, wife was struck by a wing mirror. I do hope she's okay. Um, representing the large rural area that I do, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that I hear a lot of complaints about uh, speeding and uh, other safety issues, and they can be fairly intractable and expensive. But my view is that uh, you've got to start somewhere, and a lot of uh, a lot has been achieved over the years, it, it, certainly on my patch in, in getting uh, progressive speed restrictions and uh, uh, traffic calming measures and so forth. Um, you'll be familiar, no doubt, with the problems uh, on Red Hill in ne ne next door Camerton, uh, which we're working on uh, currently. Um, so what I would say is that uh, it's very difficult to pitch in and, and deal with all these uh, kinds of issues uh, as fast as people would like. But I would be very happy to come out to Timsbury, um, perhaps in conjunction with some of your local representatives, bring an officer with me and we can go through the various issues you raised. I'm afraid I don't know the background of what may have been uh, considered suitable before, but uh, We'll have a look at that. So if that helps, uh, I'm very pleased to um, come out. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. So uh, I think that answers the question whether or not traffic calming measures are part of livable neighbourhoods. It sounds like they they very much are, um, as well as uh, addressing the problem of having um, significant amounts of traffic in a space as well. 
Joanna? I, I think also we have to recognise that for the last 40 years, the way that we've seen our rows particularly is to just keep building more of them, keep adding more cars onto them and then go, oh, now we've got these problems. So we'll put these measures in and that will solve it. And what we've seen time and time again is that is not what has happened. All it has done is has increased more and more vehicles and more and more traffic and particularly rat running in particularly residential areas. That is not the way forward. So I hear the question about rural areas. Um, first of all, we will address the urban areas in Bath and North East Somerset, but we do recognise that there needs to be wider scope for the rural areas. This is a piece of work in progress. There hasn't really been done any work in rural areas and I don't want to say what that looks like or what that should look like what we want to hear from rural areas is okay what's your problem and then how do we address that with you and your community rather than say we're just going to put in a few more extra calming things because that's what would work it hasn't worked it hasn't worked for the last 40 years because we're still getting lots of complaints what also needs to happen is is literally within all of us there has to be a culture shift to how we move about in our vehicles, if we are in a vehicle, and how we respond to people when they are pedestrians and or cyclists or e-scooters or on, on horseback or motorbikes, that they are as important and, and people walking are as important as any other highway user. Um, recently, the government are reviewing the highway code to, to actually ask the question, is that, I, I've got it the right, I'm looking at Chris now, the right way around. Um, but that, that the, the, the person in charge of the vehicle, which is more dangerous is or more or larger, is actually the person who will be now liable rather than the other way around. So there has to be a shift in culture, because if we all need to live where we live, there are lots of us, but we all need to respect each other and the benefits for public health in changing our behaviour to walking and to cycling and to active modes is significant for public health, as you've seen from the data that Chris has given you on the effect on just 20 minutes a day to our national health. It is no longer acceptable that children spend more time um, in front of computers and in their bedrooms than the average prisoner. That is not what I want for my child or for, I can believe I would want as a corporate parent for anybody else's child. We need to give people spaces back to play and back to being able to be active in their community. And this hopefully is a way to do that. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm actually going to go to one of the components, one of the key components of the, the policy, which is around low traffic uh, neighbourhoods. So there's been quite a lot of questions raised both uh, prior to this webinar and during the webinar about displacement of traffic. I think it'd be really helpful to, to have um, the panellists views. And I think this probably sums up uh, the, the sort of general uh, question, which is about how, what we're going to do to, to help those living on the busier distributor roads. So those roads that where traffic is displaced onto. So I'll take Chris first on this. Thanks, Dina. Um, I think without a doubt, we all recognise it, it's difficult. You know, there is no straightforward, easy answer to this one at all. Um, but as I said within the presentation, we're all going to get more traffic anyway if we do nothing. Uh, traffic levels are, continue, are going to continue to increase. Um, so what we're trying to do through this proposal is put forward opportunity for people to change the way they travel. Uh, real on the ground changes that allow people to feel safe to cycle and walk um, and reduce those overall numbers of vehicles traveling every day, which should reduce the, the impact onto the distributor roads as much as it does onto any other road. Um, we're also working uh, with many other proposals coming forward. So everything from the clean air zone, um, which uh, will help to reduce air quality impacts through to um, other proposals for the increased park and ride and, and similar um, and increased um, uh, use of car parking um, outside of the city for uh, public transport link, uh, link up schemes uh, and trying to just bring that all together um, in a way that tries to reduce the need for people to drive in at all. It is clear that some of the vehicles on distributed roads are the commuters coming in if we can encourage them to use public transport 
Uh, if we can get them uh, to cycle from where they are, then the overall levels of traffic go down. It's not easy. Um, air quality measuring, traffic measuring will be a critical part of our critical success factors that we will put forward. Thank you, Chris. Looking to see who wants to come in next. Well, one question that has come up is, and it fits in a little bit with what you were just saying, Chris, about um, encouraging other ways of traveling, because this isn't just about reducing traffic, is it? It's also about encouraging, actively encouraging cycling and walking and the use of public transport. So there is a question about um, how we help those who are maybe not so mobile. Um, you know, what about electric buses or um, some other, uh, you know, maybe even hydrogen buses? So I don't know whether uh, the panel, so Joanna, I think this might be a, a, an area where you know quite a lot about. So we, we, we are really aware that there needs to be what I'm calling a packet full of measures to make change. I, I recognise that, you know, successively over the years, what's often happened with transport is there's always some grand plan that solves this problem. We don't have a grand plan. What we're going to have is a packet full of measures that hopefully address lots of lo the issues, but in lots of little tiny incremental ways that build up to make a systemic change to the way we're working. So we recognize, so I saw there's a question about buses, how we work better with buses. How do we put in infrastructure that is soft infrastructure as well as hard infrastructure because that's as important what, how you map things and how you move around. And if you have an app to move around is as important because that makes people feel different. How we bring in new technology such as um, cards that could be read on all kinds of um, transport use from a bus to a train to an e-scooter. We are bringing in a trial for e-scooters. We're working with the West of England Combined Authority of that. How do we maybe do more share car sharing? How do we use the park and rides better so that they're more centres for modal change rather than for a car at which you drop off to get on a bus? Could there be different ways of thinking about that? So we're trying to be um, more um, open in the packet full of measures rather than just saying it is this. The livable neighborhoods policy is fits into this whole overall picture. And behind the scenes, there are some other pieces of work coming behind this. And this is another reason why it's so important that we want this policy to be signed off by the community because we recognize that this is just an, a part of the process. I don't think I've quite answered the question. <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. I mean, it, I can come in, Dina, if you'd like. I can come in a bit more about other modes of transport and touching on um, uh, e-scooters and um, uh, other modes that are similar to bicycle. Well, I mean, e-bikes as well, which are a, a real game changer um, on our streets in terms of bicycles are very often seen as being for um, people who are very confident, who have a good level of ability. Um, and really what the, the changes that are being made in terms of technology, um, both in terms of e-bikes, uh, cargo bikes as well, um, are making um, a level, more of a level playing field and allowing for um, a, a accessible bikes as well. It's not just um, two-wheeled bicycles for people who have um, uh, very good stability and balance, etc. And all of this is, is about opening out the opportunities for active travel to as many people as possible. And just to reiterate um, that why one of the key reasons that we are taking part in an e-scooter trial is to feed back to the government what works and does not work for us in our area so that when the government makes decisions about um, changes in legislation which will allow new types of vehicles like e-scooters onto our road they're doing it with feedback from our area so that we can make sure that it, it fits our purpose more than anything and just to quickly give an, an, an overview and reassurance of some of the ways in which we are leading 
um, and, and taking control of our e-scooter trial across the west of England to make sure that we are getting the information, but without it becoming an issue, because as Chris Major has said, we will always prioritise pedestrians first. That is the first and foremost thing. And, and we've stated that all the way through our policy documents, through the getting around Bath transport strategy, that that is our first point of call, because it is the most accessible to the largest number of people. So when we first launch um, our our scheme of which there will be about 50 to 100 scooters we um, anticipate coming onto the Bath streets and there'll be another roughly 100 plus more coming on in a, in a, in a second phase. We will be limiting the speed limit to 10 miles an hour which is, is considerably under the 15 and a half miles an hour that the government has set. Um, and we will be dropping the speed limit to five miles an hour in certain areas and right down to zero, so not allowing it in other areas. And we'll be absolutely explicit and testing all of those geofence locations before we go live. Because it is of, of that, whilst we want to encourage and enable people to use alternative modes of transport, instead of single car, um, single occupancy car use, we will always is prioritise and make sure that we are protecting the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you, Jess. So the question then about low traffic neighbourhoods. How do we, so I'm just trying to, to sort of shape some of the questions that have come in. How do we uh, make this less of a a stick to beat um, you know car drivers with and something that people feel is more a positive choice Joanna you asked Chris yes. you said Chris okay Chris sorry <laughs> <laughs> well you were all nodding so I thought you were all coming <laughs> I think it's a really key point again, Dina, isn't it? It's about trying to um, set out the environment in which we are living, to ask people those, those fundamental questions about whether or not this is what we want, and this is the way we want to continue. We know air quality has a whole life effect from the youngest to the oldest resident is being affected by air quality issues every day. We know the impact of physical inactivity on, on people's health. And I think what we're trying to put forward is a strategy that says we can be different. We can find a new normal. It's not going to be easy. It's going to have its challenges as we go forward. Um, but I'm sure that there's many people watching, uh, many people in our communities who would like to walk more. Certainly where I live, I saw, I saw more people walking uh, during the lockdown because there was less traffic. If we can embed those, those um, behaviours, um, if we can embed those options for people, um, that we can really offer not only um, the current population, but future um, generations, um, cleaner, safer, more active ways to move around the city, uh, which is going to be good for everyone. Um, but again, I do recognise that it's individual areas and individual issues, and we're not at that point at the moment. This is the high level strategies that we're talking about, the principles we're talking about. Once we go out to, commun uh, to communities and we start uh, talking to them about their areas, there's gonna be lots of different hurdles to overcome. But what we're committed to is finding solutions to those hurdles, is trying to think differently. It might be iterative, it might not be all in one go, um, but we are really trying to say to people, um, this is a time to be different. I think there's a national push towards it. There's definitely a local push towards it. And um, we're keen to be at the forefront rather than dragging behind on this issue. And I think actually the point you make about there not being one size fits all, I think is really, really good. And the fact that we, you know, what, once a policy has been, um, you know, fully consulted on and uh, put in place, and then we will be able to talk about individual schemes and um, you know, have those discussions with the community, with ward councillors, uh, and actually make sure that what is being proposed is is the right um, the right solution for for the, the the problem or the issue in that in that particular area. I think I, I think you know, as a ward councillor, when you knock on doors and you talk to people, it's it's quite clear everybody's bothered by traffic, but everybody thinks it's because it's just somebody else. And if only they could change their behavior, 
then, then it'll be sorted. And can't I just get on with sorting out other people's behavior? I think there has to be a recognition that we are all in this, we are a community in this together and that we have to work at this together. And there are going to be, have to be compromises by all of us in this. So it's gonna be a tough ask for all of us because if we want to live as a community and have better health, to have better lives for our children, to be able to have um, more um, access to active travel, then we're gonna to have to make some compromises and that's gonna be some tough choices around us. So. I know already with the experience I've had this summer um, is that lots of people don't like that choice and are quite cross. But what what other options do we have at this point? And, and the reason, again, we go back to this policy work and why we are introducing it in the way that we are is that we want to bring the community with us and take them through the process so that we all recognise that change needs to happen because we all feel that, that this is a problem. Thank you, Joe. So one of the, uh, well, some of the points that Jess was making earlier were around changing the, the kind of your choices. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at electric vehicles perhaps, uh, which leads me on to one of the other um, uh, parts of the, of the, the, um, the consultation, which is around electric vehicle charging points. Uh, Jess, did you want to just speak a bit more about um, EVs? Um, I know there's been some questions about, uh, you know, the grid's uh, capacity and also those living in Bath will be, uh, have concerns around, you know, the, the sort of heritage streets and, and whether or not uh, they can plug into lampposts, etc. Thank you, Dina. Yes, so um, we, we understand that um, there is uh, changes afoot and that we want to lead from the front and support uh, the changes to cleaner vehicles. Um, and we already have, uh, I think it's around uh, 2022 um, points, charging points across Baines, Bath and North East Somerset as a whole already. Um, and we have committed to double that number by um, the end of uh, um, but we had committed to do it by the end of this financial year, but with COVID, there are some things that have um, uh, <laughs> caused a bit of problems for us, so that, that programme is slipping a little bit. Um, and this policy goes above and beyond that because we, we did consult across the West of England. Um, I think it's key to say that we understand that the way that people travel is not just within um, Bath or within Baines, but we, we know absolutely for many years in transport planning that people do, about, I think it's about 90% of the journeys are within the West of England. So um, across um, the um, electric vehicle charging issue, we have worked very strongly with our partners, um, Bristol, South Gloucestershire and um, uh, North um, uh, Somerset as well, because we understand that the, the needs for ind individuals as consumers is not just within our boundaries. And, and that is one of the reasons that, that we have committed to doing this um, as a, effectively as a consortium across the West of England, so that when people um, arrive at, at any given point, they um, will be able to have access um, through one uh, membership as opposed to having to um, have separate memberships for every point that they come to or having um, half a dozen different uh, swipe cards that they need to. We also understand that um, it, it, although there is or was an opportunity to leave this to market forces, we're not in the business of um, of, of, of um, supplying petrol stations, for example. So why is it that we are moving into electric vehicle charging? We understand that there is, it is a real need to think strategically and not just be led by market demands. Um, otherwise, we would end up in a position where very busy areas, which are also often very affluent areas, um, have points available to them and there will be other areas, rural um, locations included, which um, the, the market forces will not be dictating to put the points into. So by working across the West of England and by um, taking control of it ourselves, we are um, endeavouring to make sure that we are thinking strategically um, in, in this regard. Uh, also know having done consultation that people 
very much, I guess, unsurprisingly, um, have a preference um, for charging at home. And whilst for people who have the, the luxury of having um, off street parking can go ahead and, and um, uh, get grants um, and install something themselves, there's an, an awfully large proportion of people within our authority who don't have um, off street parking. So it's important to us to be through strategy, thinking through these challenges and, and planning ahead. And that is why it's important that um, the on-street residential charging is alongside the low traffic neighborhoods portion of this and, and therefore is our livable neighborhoods. Um, one of the questions I noted um, in the questions and answers, and as you said, Dina, is about uh, preserving um, the historic nature and also the public realm. And absolutely, this is, this is a, a key um, issue for us, making sure that when we are um, uh, choosing where locations are going and installing, that we are not um, compromising the footpath and we're not reducing the space that is available to people who are um, moving around. Um, we do have limitations placed on us. We are, are to a certain degree at um, the mercy of Western power distribution, our um, the electric supply network that we have. Um, and um, unfortunately for us, they have, have given us a clear indication that um, street lighting columns will not be um, a, a acceptable means to provide charging. Um, and that's not something that we can do anything about. Um, but we, we have continual discussions with Western Power, with um, Bristol and South Gloucestershire and North Somerset, and we will continue to look at all of the emerging technologies and consider what is the best for the public purse and um, the, the public position on this. So that's why it is important for us to have the on-street residential as part of this plan going forwards. Thank you, Jess. And I, I guess the obvious question there is why do we have to, uh, to use Western Power if they're not willing to work with us um, and to, to help us? Unfortunately, they, they um, uh, manage the network and that's uh, the only option that we have. We all are um, at, at the, uh, the, the mercy of Western Power for our uh, electricity connections. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, so just on the question of um, EV and, and charging points, uh, I think I'm right. Uh, a little while ago, I was having um, some conversations with uh, um, parish councils um, in North East Somerset, and I know that there was quite a, uh, a strong desire to have electric um, charging points out in, in the villages. Um, I don't know whether Neil um, or, or Jess wants to come in on, on how we provide uh, such a facility um, in, in North East Somerset in the more rural areas. Well, what, what I can say is that a number of uh, people across my ward have taken it upon themselves to put charging points in, which, which is encouraging. But obviously, um, you know, there's certain limitations on uh, doing this in, in uh, rural areas, well, in, in any areas, really. So I'd be interested to see, to hear if Jess has any <laughs> comment on that. But certainly, there are a lot of people out there who worry about imposing a you know a greener footprint as it were and uh, are looking for guidance to to do the right thing i'm sure all the people on this call have, have logged in in order to try to to do the right thing as best they can mm. jess um, clarity on our position around um residential charging um, as it currently stands, we do not um, we do not allow people to uh, trail uh, cables across uh, the footpath. Um, I understand that there have been other councils that have put in place some some measures and allowed people to do that with um, coverings over uh, the cables, and, and we we do not. It, it, it would still be whatever you put in place to make it. Um, as little a trip hazard as possible. It still is a trip hazard. And for people who are partially sighted and for people with, with um, uh, buggies and wheelchairs, it is an issue. And as, as we've stated all the way through this, we protect 
um, the vulnerable as much as possible. So um, for residential um, uh, charging, that is why we have this policy so that we can move forwards and find something that will we'll provide. Um, in the short term, we are um, looking at putting a, a publicly um, available point in Radstock and in Midsummer Norton. So we are starting to reach out uh, outside, outside of Bath um, uh, because we understand that you know we don't all, all live in Bath, and we've also we've already got one in Canesham, and we're looking to put um, more in Canesham as well. Um, but we. We will always um, think as strategically as we can. The priority up until now has been um, the most centrally located and um, well utilized places. And there is still plenty of capacity within our existing um, uh, charging locations, but that isn't stopping us from increasing um, the number that we're gonna be putting in um, this year. And it isn't stopping us from looking ahead um, at residential charging going forward. Thank you. And uh, just in response to a question that's come up about, um, you know, that we're getting off the subject of uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, low traffic neighbourhoods and electric charging points, and also the next uh, topic, which will be about residence parking zones, all fit underneath the umbrella of livable neighbourhoods, which is actually the, the, the subject of today's um, webinar. And I know that it is uh, very easily confuse the terms of livable neighbourhoods and and low traffic neighbourhoods, and it's you know just helpful just to remind everybody that this policy that we are consulting on is livable neighbourhoods. It's an umbrella term that covers a number of um, other strategies underneath it. Um, so, having mentioned residence parking zones, which is a bit of a knotty problem, I know many places have. Um, had residence parking zones being developed over a number of years. So how will this policy help move those, those schemes forward? Thanks, Dina. Um, yeah, absolutely. We're very much aware there's a number of areas within the city that have had long-standing requests. Um, we're really keen to take forward the resident parking strategy within the livable neighbourhood strategy. Um, and it allows us to um, really develop uh, those schemes at pace we recognise the need, we recognise people are frustrated that it seems to have taken a long time um, and we're keen to get them moving. So my advice would be complete the consultation, give us your views, allow us to um, understand what changes we need to make to the policies, allow us to get them adopted as, as council policies. Um, hopefully we're looking for December and that really gives us a chance to start um, in the new year delivering these schemes uh, and we are committed to doing so as part of the strategy that's laid out. Yes, I'd just like to back Chris up on that. I, I have been chasing him about residence parking zones, particularly in areas that were had begun them and where were we and can we take those forward? So we really recognise that an awful lot of residents have been waiting on this for some time. We wanted to get this policy in place first so that we can take that then at a pace further but this is really quite central to that piece of work and until that's in place it, it's it's a, a challenge to do that the other positive is that we're going to have a new member of staff that is going to be working uh, alongside um, the team to help with some of these issues so that's a great addition to the Baines Council particularly so I'm, I'm really grateful in, at this particular time when money is short that we've been able to bring on a new member of staff to help with the sustainable transport. Hmm. Thank you and uh, so a question's come up on several several times about bike storage is bike storage something that could be covered in residence parking? Yeah absolutely um, we recognise the need um, for this and we are committed as part of the livable neighbourhoods uh, development to uh, develop on street uh, bike storage secure on street bike storage because I think that's the key um, but we're also looking how that impacts going forward into our um, planning and development policies um, to make sure that the consideration of electric bike storage on street is taken as seriously as uh, car storage seems to have been or has historically have been um, so we're really keen to do that. Other authorities already have them. We will be doing them. Um, yeah, we really recognise that there's a lack of storage in this area for bicycles. And that is something that, I, again, I've been champing at the bit on with officers and how do we um, rectify that. We haven't got a solution at the moment, but we, we're clearly aware that it's high on our agenda. And I also noticed in the question, there's quite a lot of comment about 
cyclists knocking people over and, and how dangerous they are. I think that's a really interesting point because nobody says that about motorists. And we have to recognize that every year, I think it's, am I right, Chris, 2000 people are killed by motorists. And if they're not killed, they're seriously injured or um, disabled from them. So this attack on cyclists, oh, well, they knocked this group of people over, is not heard by the motorist community, that they have killed 2000 people this year. So I, I recognize that cyclists could behave better, but equally, I think motorists need to as well. And I think that that's a point that we should all pick up on. I drive a car, how I drive my car, it's probably the most dangerous thing I will ever do. I think the point about us all being responsible, whatever mode of transport we are, are taking, you know, is, is, is well made actually. And uh, just because you're in one vehicle, it doesn't override any responsibility you have to any other uh, road, road user. I think it goes back to this whole idea of culture change. We need to recognise how we move around, whether we're walking, cycling, e-scootering, um, being on a bus uh, or driving a vehicle affects somebody else and we need to be responsible in that space and everybody is important. Mm. It's a, you know, it has some similarities I think to how we are um, uh, addressing uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we all need to be responsible. We have to take responsibility for ourselves and also about our impact on, on, on others as well. Um, so I'm aware that we're, we're coming up to We've got only about 10 more minutes of our, um, of our webinar. Um, now I've just realized, I think my, my actual watch is running slow. We have less time than that. Uh, so I just wanted to, to ask a couple of more questions that have come up in, as I said, you know, both in the, the, the um, sending questions and also those on, uh, that coming in from the audience. So there's a, a big issue around speeding. So can, and going back to livable neighborhoods, uh, sorry, the um, low traffic neighborhoods, you know, is there a space, uh, you know, within this policy to address speeding? Can I first of all address the issue of 20 mile an hour zones and, and why we can't do that as a whole city? Because I think, you know, this was something I certainly struggled with when I first came into this position. And Chris, I can see smiling because he's had to have this discussion with me many times. What you have to do as a, you can't, if in the city you will see if there's street lights, there are no signs. And that means it's a 30 mile an hour zone. If you have a 20 mile an hour zone, you have to put up a sign that says 20 mile an hour zone. If we were to make the whole city a 20 mile an hour zone, we would have to put a 20 mile an hour sticker on every street light. And that is an enormous cost. So how we think about that um, reduction in, in speed is, is a problem. Now we're certainly having to, I'm looking at Chris, he's sort of lifting his eyes up. So maybe I've said that incorrectly. There is a huge amount of legality around our roads. And that for me has been the biggest lesson in being the, in this role of cabinet member for transport. There are, a, there are four highways acts there. They have lots of different parts to them and we have to follow the law on them. And the way that we then have to do that is either through civil law or through criminal law. And that is where there is always a problem. If it's a civil offence, the council can do something. If it's a criminal offence, the police have to do something about that. And the way that government has structured the law has made some of that very complicated. So you think, oh, well, why aren't the council getting on with this? It's because it's a criminal offence and the police have to do something. And where those two spaces um, interlink, there is even more tension between who does what and where. So, I mean, I'm gonna let Chris follow that up, but it's a real problem. Um, and it, I hope government, particularly central government, make that law more easy to understand for all authorities. Thank you. So Chris, if you could um, just clarify uh, the, the the rules and and actually be really helpful I think to hear about how that impacts on um, those living in rural areas as well where I know in villages there is a constant uh, con concern about speed. Yeah, I think if I may, Dean, I think I'd bring it back to livable neighbourhoods. Firstly, uh, the reality is by using modal filters and similar within um, livable neighbourhoods, the numbers of vehicles travelling down any road 
uh, reduces significantly, the through traffic is, is removed from the area. Um, that means those who are entering each street are generally local people or deliveries who, who need to go to there. And that generally brings the speed down overall anyway. Um, and, and I think that's what we're trying to say is um, for, for a long time, the behaviours of, of motorists have not um, necessarily uh, reflected what people want to see within their community. By using uh, livable neighbourhoods, by giving the spaces back to people, by encouraging more and more people to cycle and walk and giving them the space too, it reduces the speed overall of vehicles, etc. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'm not going to go into the requirements of the law around the speeding because I've got to be honest with you, I'm probably not the best person to do it. I have uh, other officers who are much more technically able and I wouldn't like to say anything that was misleading. Um, but what we do know is that all of our policies are becoming harmonised going forward and they are all about supporting people, not vehicles. That's the key thing we want to take away from here. Vehicles are brilliant. They are absolutely essential for many, many things. But there's lots of times and lots of places and lots of uses for them that are also detrimental to others. And what we're trying to do is harmonise all those policies going forward um, to give communities back their spaces to allow them to, to meet, to engage in different ways. Um, and that's the message we'd like to give away here. The other point, just if you, if you don't mind, just to pick up is um, some people have mentioned a lack of mention of public transport. It is absolutely vital within all of these proposals. Um, linking public transport to walking and cycling is a given. Perhaps I didn't make it as clear as I should have done within my, my presentation. Um, no, we're absolutely right. Public transport um, is going through a really difficult time with COVID. We know that. Uh, the trains and the buses are both um, reliant on central government for funding at the moment. But hopefully, uh, if we find a solution to the COVID issue, uh, vaccine comes forward, etc. Um, we will be working with the operators of both of those, those services to try and make sure people have options. It has to be linked up. We're also working with the West of England Combined Authority to bring that forward. Um, and that's the key point. We're trying to join everything up. Thank you. So I, I guess in, in summary, the livable neighbourhood uh, policy is absolutely critical to so that everybody can have a better quality of life, whether they live in the city or in the rural area. So I would urge everybody, if you haven't already made a contribution to the consultation, to do so. As uh, Chris said at the beginning, the consultation has been extended to uh, the 18th of Octo October, yes, which is Sunday, which is a Sunday. Um, and so I would just like to say thank you very much to my panellists, to, to Chris, to Joanna, Jessica and to Neil and also to everybody that's helped uh, put this web webinar together and to all those that have helped behind the scenes and obviously thank you very much to our audience uh, and for all the questions that you've uh, given us. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and I look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.